Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for this kind introduction. It's really a great honor to be a distinguished lecturer for the Munich Center for Quantum Science and Technology. I would say that uh, your center that you built a few years ago now that I have the chance to follow because you asked me to be on the board is really inspiring. Uh, it's really inspiring to see what you've done, what you're doing in terms of uh, bringing together different communities, uh, creating synergies, supporting uh, some activities like the Distinguished Postdoc uh, program, I see. I would say that's very nice too. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for all of this, for make, inviting me here, giving me this opportunity. And I'm gonna present the work that uh, we do uh, in this, uh, I put the beautiful pictures because uh, of course uh, we have this new building at the Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. It's a joint CNRS, University Paris Saclay Lab. Uh, the quantum initiative that you were mentioning, Emmanuel, is we called it just quantum at Paris Saclay here. Uh, I have uh, been uh, working very hard to create this. It was created a year ago. And uh, yeah, it's uh, now uh, discussing with the national quantum initiative to see how the organization will go between uh, national and local initiatives. Uh, so the title of my talk is Quantum Light for Quantum Technologies. Like uh, you, you mentioned, I, I am, uh, my team is working uh, in this uh, field of optical quantum technologies. And it's just um, in the very, uh, very condensed way to see what we do. This is this first slide that I like to show that we fabricate semiconductor devices. Uh, we, we use all the tools of optoelectronics and you can fabricate these kind of chips here that are looks like regular chips. But if you zoom in, you will find this kind of wheel shape structure that we show you that these are optical cavities. And in the center of each of the optical cavity, we have an artificial atom and with this kind of devices, we uh, we have a lot of fun actually uh, working on quantum light generation, but we also work on quantum light manipulation. And I will maybe not discuss too much the second part, but uh, mostly focus on the quantum light generation part in this talk. So just the first um, a few slides on the context, the motivation of these studies. Uh, what is the place that light should take could play take in quantum technologies? Uh, I would start by saying that what we like about light is that there are many flavors of quantum light. Uh, you can think of encoding the information using a discrete variable scheme uh, when you play with photons, or you can think of continue thinking of light as a wave and play with continuous variable uh, schemes where you will work more with a Wigner function of the state and things like that. And there are also very many degrees of freedom that we can use to encode the information. And this is also very uh, interesting. You can use path, polarization, orbital regular momentum, time, energy, and I will discuss in this talk photon number as well, which I think is quite fun. And uh, with all these possibilities, you know that uh, lights is um, thought for uh, many applications, starting with maybe the most emblematic one, which is quantum communication, uh, where the first emblematic application is quantum T distribution, which is a very small part of quantum communication. But actually, this can be done with attenuated lasers. When you play the trick of using a um, decoy state on top of it, you, can probably, you don't probably need a real quantum light to do that. However, if you want to go to long distances and high rates, you would need a real source of actually single photons in this, in this instance. Which brings me to the second um, application that is forcing for quantum light, which is obviously quantum networks. So there are lots of works, uh, especially also in Munich uh, in these topics. Uh, the idea is to um, link different nodes uh, using quantum light. And there are many architectures that are envisioned for that. I think. Uh, I, Many of them are uh, still emerging. Like in classical technologies, there is not a single way to do things. You have many ways to do things. I just highlight here two types of uh, quantum networks, uh, some based on memories, where you go from one node to another, storing the information in the long-term quantum memory. But the other based on uh, measurement, where you remove the need for quantum memory, and instead you replace uh, the you, you work with a more sophisticated state of light where you have many photons that are untangled. And so in this uh, scheme here, you have 12 photons, which are represented by the circles, and each line is an entanglement link. And with this kind of state that you engineer specially for certain application, you can remove the need for quantum memories. And I think these uh, both um, architectures are uh, interesting and probably will we combined at some point to really go in a larger scale quantum network. 
And then, of course, there is optical quantum computing. Uh, light has been one of the first systems that has been used to explore the idea of quantum computing, and there are good reasons for that. Uh, photons, light in vacuum, does not interact with everything, with anything. So actually, they don't suffer intrinsically from decoherence. So that's, of course, very attractive. In general, when you think of discrete variable, it's very easy to implement single qubit gates. So if you, if you encode the information in polarization, you just need a wave place to go from H to any superposition of H and B. And this is basically the single qubit, universal single qubit gate. It can be done at, at room temperature. It can be done on chip. And it's a platform where, of course, um, it's uh, naturally a platform you can think of to do distributed quantum computing if you want to put different quantum processors in parallel. But of course, all these come at a very uh, strong price that it's difficult to implement photon-photon gates. Photons are non-interacting particles. So how do we fabricate these photon-photon gates? So actually, I should say that there, are, um, there is a kind of a roadmap to move forward in optical quantum computing, uh, addressing progressively the different challenges. So in the NISC area, in the in small scale quantum computing, there is a lot we can do with this just linear uh, quantum computing, where you just make use of the quantum interference of indistinguishable photons to fabricate the gates. I will come back to that later. If you want to go to scale up, there are now very uh, well established protocols where you would uh, do that by uh, using measurement-based quantum computing. So you replace the need to perform gates between photons by starting with large states of light, which show a lot of entanglement. And you replace the two uh, photon gates by single uh, qubit measurements, and uh, this is somehow just a transfer, changing the order into which you do things. And uh, there are now uh, ways to scale up quantum computing with this kind of resources. And there is also a third uh, way that is still explored, which uh, would rely on in, um, introducing nonlinear gates uh, at the single photon level that could even uh, also allow to uh, do photon photon gate in an efficient way. So I should say there are all these possibilities, nice uh, perspective at the NISC level, and uh, many ways to, uh, to scale up. And this momentum has actually translated into creation of startups. So you, you probably know about PsyQuantum in the US, which has raised to $500 million now. I think Xanadu in Canada also has raised more than two or $300 million. In Europe, we don't have the same kind of venture capital model. So there are smaller startups, but you can think of QX in the Netherlands, which is working on silicon nitride-based quantum computing, or ORCA uh, um, that has uh, emerged uh, from the group of Ian Wormsley uh, based on the memories, atomic memories quantum computing. And all this momentum has been somehow further uh, supported by the demonstration of quantum computational advantage with photons, which was done with, uh, by the group of Chan Wei Pan uh, last December, uh, which is uh, a demonstration of uh, um, computational advantage in a boson sampling scheme, which is somewhere in between discrete and continuous variable for quantum optics, which is also, I think, quite nice. And this setup is just completely crazy and impressive uh, experimental realization. So what are the challenges of light, quantum light generation? And from now on, I will just discuss in the framework of discrete variables, where I will discuss single photons. The ideal source of single photon would generate light pulses, and in each pulse you would have exactly one photon, no more, no less. Uh, of course, in practice, we'll never have a 100% probability to actually get a photon, so we define the probability to have one photon per pulse as one of the important metrics, and we call that, we can call that the brightness, because it's the only thing that we can call a brightness for a single photon source. And for many applications, we need this single photon state to be in a pure quantum state. And this is because we want to be able to perform this quantum interference of indistinguishable particles. When you send two single Fox state on the beam splitter, you have these four possibilities, and these two in the center cancel out when you have indistinguishable particles. So in practice, it means that we want to create light pulses, so you have different frequencies. So you want to create, actually, if I work in a second quantization basis, where I, I, dis I have a discretization in wave plane with uh, different frequencies, the state I want to create is this kind of superposition of single photon Fox state of different frequencies. And I want to be able to define a mode, which means that I want to have always the same coefficient, the same complex coefficient. So it means that I want to create a pure quantum superposition in the frequency domain. OK, so the optical quantum technologies have, have actually uh, 
developed beautifully uh, in the last 20 years using frequency conversion-based sources. Single photon sources that you can get by playing with a laser and a nonlinear crystal. This is the first generation, I would say, of quantum light sources. And there is a new emerging one that is based on quantum images. So just to be uh, completely um, clear about what I mean here, we are discussing the heralding single photon scheme where you send a laser on a nonlinear crystal, you create photon pairs, you operate all this at a very low probability of generating a photon pair. And, and when you do that, the state that you have at the output of your crystal is mostly vacuum, sometimes a pair, sometimes two. And this is not a photon, uh, single photon state. And actually, the probability of having one pair is quite low. It's eta squared. But if you put a detector on one output here, you somehow project your output state in a situation when you have removed the vacuum component of the state. And you end up uh, with a state on the other path, which is very close to a single photon state here. There is just a little bit of two photons that remains. So if you work with a very, very low eta here, very low probability of generating a pair in the first place, you have a source that is very close to a single photon Fox state. And of course, this is an intrinsic limitation that somehow the source efficiency is almost equal to the error rate of your source because eta square is also the probability of being two photons. So these uh, uh, sources, they show a lot of advantages. They can be operated at room temperature. You can play with a lot lot of parameters, frequency comes and stuff like that to play with a lot of time functionality, etc. But there is this interesting limitation. And there are different ways that are explored to solve this problem. Uh, one was pro proposed by um, Paul Quiet uh, two years ago, where you just uh, actually have temporal multiplexing, you wait to have a photon and until you have, you have a low probability of having it, but you can store it and uh, keep a number of photons. And then when you have the number of photons you want, you can send them to your chip. The other way that has been adopted by Psy Quantum, for instance, is just to fabricate thousands of chips. And, uh, and one of them will fire, and then you have a router that uh, routes the photon to the right input. So that's challenging, but it's, uh, if you have the heavy foundry uh, technologies, it is feasible. The other possibility is to use a natural source of single photons that we have in nature, which is just a two-level system, an atom. And when you shine light on an atom, you always get a single photon. This is known for more than 30, 40 years now. This is not enough. We want an atom that actually emits in one direction because we want to collect the photons, uh, always collect the photons. So we want what we call sometimes a 1D atom, atoms that covers to just one mode of the electromagnetic field. So there are many ways to do that. You can implement that with natural atoms that is, like it is done, for instance, in the group of Gerhard Rempe in Garchin and also in many groups in Europe uh, playing with cold atoms. And you can do that with many artificial atoms, semiconductor quantum dots, defects in diamond, rare earth, uh, uh, ions in crystals, carbon nanotubes, molecules, etc., etc. The list is infinite. I will focus on our technology, which is the same as the one uh, developed by John Finlay and Kai Wheeler, for instance, at, uh, uh, in Munich. Uh, which is based on semiconductor quantum dots. So rapidly, I want to summarize the key ingredients of our, tech, our approach and then uh, tell you a bit of the newest results that we have. So the key ingredient is uh, indium gallium arsenide quantum dots that has been known to emit single photons since 2000. And to make the photon emitted in one direction, we uh, insert it in a cavity, a micropillar cavity, where we have two mirrors surrounding uh, a lambda cavity and the quantum dose is in its center. And with that, we implement cavity quantum electrodynamics. We accelerate the spontaneous emission of the quantum dot into the mode of the cavity. And we are playing in the weak coupling regime where the spontaneous emission is just accelerated by a factor FP. And then the probability to collect the photon in the mode is roughly FP divided by FP plus one. So we can get very high efficiency with quite moderate per cell factor. Then you also need to work a little bit on the engineering of the cavity because you want the photons that are emitted in the cavity to exit where you want them to exit. So this is the output coupling efficiency that needs to be optimized as well. So with these two ingredients, oh, I should mention something. Uh, in 2008, um, we developed a technology that allows us to position the quantum that is exactly where we want it to be in a cavity. And that's a very important uh, feature because quantum dots have random position and we have full control of the system. So with these ingredients in 2013, we could show a very high brightness single photon source. We got something like 80%. So we just uh, 
measure what is the probability to get a photon when we ask for it at the output of the device. And this is, I think, something still close to the state of the art. It's not going to be easy to do better than that, although we need to go closer to 200% for um, further scalability. But this was not um, enough for quantum technologies because the single photon we were generating were partly indistinguishable. They were not very close to a pure quantum state. So we had to develop new ingredients to somehow tune down the noise around the quantum dot. We need to get rid of all uh, unwanted fluctuating environments. So the first thing we did is to uh, reduce charge noise by inserting the quantum dot in a diode structure. We can really play with semiconductor to do that. And uh, by doing that, we had to define uh, our cavity a bit differently. We don't etch all around to have micro pillars, but we etch, we keep some uh, Wendy ridges where, and that allows us to define an electrical contact. And when uh, we do that, it's nice because we can basically apply a voltage and sweep away the charges that would be fluctuating around our emitter. So that's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is uh, that we implemented, which is something very uh, obvious for uh, atomic physics, but when you deal with micron-sized objects, it's not so easy to implement. Uh, resonant excitation to implement coherent control of the state. So we, we implemented that. And we do that in a very efficient way so that actually we just need typically on average a laser pulse with on average 10 photons to reach a pi pulse. And the decay of the radio oscillations here are just limited by spontaneous emission. And the last thing that we um, done, we have done uh, not really on purpose, but we understood afterwards why it was working so well is to, uh, by playing with cavity quantum electrodynamics, we reduce phonon decoherence. In any solid state system, you can have an intrinsic emission at the transition of your emitter, but you can also have an emission where the emitter exchange energy with the vibrations of the crystal, either absorbing or emitting a photon. And this translates in the spectrum by having photon silence. And what we understood and demonstrated is that if you put the quantum dot in the cavity that accelerates the spontaneous emission of your intrinsic transition, you somehow uh, shorten the interaction time with the uh, phonons and you reduce the probability for the emitter to emit uh, with and without phonons. So you end up reducing a lot of phonon cyber and contribution. That is what we have demonstrated here. So when we did all this uh, in 2016, we ended up having very indistinguishable photons, which we evidence in this paper. Uh, you take all these ingredients together and you generate two photons with the same device, you send them on the beam splitter, and if the photons are indistinguishable, they should exit together. And you should never have two clicks at the output of the beam splitter. And this is what you observe here at the peak at zero delay, which is where we would expect uh, to have extra clicks, clicks if the photons are indistinguishable. We had hardly signal, any signal in the noise, which showed that we had indistinguishability uh, above 99% for the first time. So this story I've just uh, told you in a rapid way it has been somehow the effort of a community over the years. The quantum dot community has been developing nicely since uh, 2013. I would say that we were able since 2013 on the map where I plot the indistinguishability on the x-axis and the brightness of the source on the y-axis and the ideal source in the upper right corner. Between 2013, 2015, we have this um, uh, possibility where we were able to have very bright sources or very indistinguishable one, but we were not able to combine both. Sources based on barrettry ground conversion were, are uh, in this uh, region where it's intrinsically limited to low efficiency. And since 2016, we are uh, progressing on this vertical uh, area here, the red area, where we have gained more than a factor of 10 in terms of efficiency as compared to uh, single photon sources. And we are actually progressing uh, nicely over the month. So in terms of impact, uh, what does it mean to gain a factor of 10 in terms of efficiency? Uh, clearly, when you want to play with n qubits to do optical quantum computing, you gain a factor 10 power to the n. And this is uh, the first thing that has uh, started to happen with uh, this kind of sources. Um, the, Boson sampling scheme, which is very similar to the uh, sampling scheme that was also developed by Google to demonstrate quantum advantage uh, two years ago, has first been uh, explored with our photons. And uh, it was stuck at the level of three or four photons uh, until uh, we could provide these new sources. So Andrew White, uh, to whom we gave a source, um, 
did a three photon um, measurement with a uh, hundred time acceleration and the group on Chinong, uh, Chang Wei Fine and Chai Long Lu. So the same year they accelerated by a factor a million for five photons. And when Google uh, published the quantum advantage, they were uh, reporting 20 input photons uh, with a similar technology in the, still in the group of Chai Long. Um, you see the beautiful setup here. Uh, they are doing all this in free space, which is uh, quite impressive. Uh, and I think no one is trying to compete with them actually on this. Uh, people are trying rather to try to find a way this, uh, to do that on, uh, in an integrated way. Uh, on our side, in terms of technology, we have, uh, as I said, we move in a, two, in a new building and we had no technology for three years, so, which is very difficult in these times. But what we've done is that we had fabricated many sources before moving. So we have benchmarked our technology, identify what we can do. So we have nice reproducibility in the performances for many sources. And we have now, we know now what we need to do to go uh, to do uh, more reproducible uh, technology to have more sources to be able to make maybe at some point parallel um, sources where we could generate indistinguishable photons from distinguished, sorry, from remote sources. Okay, so now I want to discuss more recent results. And uh, well, our efforts to go to even higher efficiency. And I want to discuss that because on the way we are, it, it, it could sound that we are doing new engineering and actually it's new physics and I find it very fun. So we, we need to go above here. And uh, as soon as you have 30%, people ask for 50% and they will never stop until you get close to 100% efficiency. So there was, uh, in the previous scheme, there were some very, uh, strong limitation to the efficiency we can get. And uh, the, it's a very practical reason that when you do resonant excitation to have highly indistinguishable photon with a micron size emitter, uh, basically the, you need to get rid of the laser. So you excite with one polarization and you collect in the cross polarization. And to do that, you need an emitter that can emit lights. When you excite it with one polarization, you can re-emit light in the other polarization. So the usual way of doing that is to use what we call a charge quantum dot. So it's a quantum dot where there is a hole. And it's actually a four level system where you have two uh, optical selection rules uh, linking the spin up or spin down to the excited state with right or left secular polarized light, which is by the way, at the core of spin photon entanglement that we want to use to create cluster state of light. You can rewrite these selection rules in a linear polarization basis. And you see that you can excite with one polarization and collect photon in the other polarization. But you lose on the way half of the photons. So you, you are uh, bound to lower than 50% efficiency if you play with this kind of scheme. So there is a way around it, which was proposed again by the group of Chai Longlu in China, is to implement polarized parcel effect. You, you will implement a parcel effect in a cavity that shows birefringence. And then you accelerate a spontaneous emission in one polarization at the expense of the other. And by doing that, they managed to have 60% efficiency uh, in 2019. And in the group of uh, Richard Warburton, they managed to do even better because they, were, they got 50%, 53%, but it was already fibered. So this is, these are beautiful results. What I want to tell you is about another way that we are approaching this problem, which uh, I um, like to share with you because it, uh, it shows that actually we can actually use the, fun, the solid state environment to gain in efficiency and it's quite fun. So the idea is to exploit the natural asymmetry of the quantum dots and the vibrations, the photons. So first, the idea is that actually in quantum dots we have uh, naturally polarized single photon sources. If you take just a neutral quantum dot, uh, you have a reduction of the symmetry because your system is not perfectly symmetric and you end up with two dipoles which are linearly polarized. So it's a one one state, two excited state with linear polarization selection. So you have a hundred percent linear polarization which is already available in the system. The problem is that you cannot use that to do resonant excitation. So what we explored is a way where we use phonon to uh, have an efficient excitation despite the fact that we are detuned from the transition. So you excite slightly detuned from the transition and you will use uh, uh, the phonon coupling to get a very efficient occupation of the state. So by doing that, we can excite slightly off resonantly and excite in one polarization and collect in the other. And you see here that we excite X, correct X or Y, and we have almost no signal in the 
uh, the perpendicular polarization, and we end up with a very high degree of linear polarization. So we get away from this 50% problem by going from polarization rejection to spectral rejection of the laser. But if you think as uh, not a, uh, someone working with atoms, you would think that we will never get a very high occupation of the excited state when you detune the laser from the quantum dot transition. This is what uh, uh, quantum optics tells you. And this is where uh, it's quite nice. Uh, it's based on theoretical work that were uh, published um, from 2013. The idea is that you start with your grounded excited state of the quantum dot, you excite with a laser that is detuned, and you go into the rotating frame. So you end up with these two states, which are detuned by your laser detuning here. And what happens is that when you switch on your laser, you dress the state by the optical stack effect. And you dress the state in a way that the distance between the two states is now uh, very well suited for phonon emission between the two states. So you start with the system which is in the ground state, and then we switch on the laser, you dress the state, and there is a phonon emission, a very rapid and efficient phonon emission that takes place during the pulse that brings your system efficiently in the excited state at the end of the pulse. So the, the physics is quite nice, and it's also uh, very interesting in terms of uh, theory because all this works well if you have a proper shaping of your pulse so that you, you dress the state smoothly enough and you end up your, your pulse smoothly enough so that all, all, everything goes well. But what it was shown back in 2013 is that with such a scheme, you can actually get a population which is uh, of the excited state, which is almost 100% all at the level of what you get with resonant excitation. So this is the occupation of the excited state as a function of the pulse area. You see the oscillation that you observe when you do coherent control. And this is what you get when you do phonon assisted excitation. And you can go to very high occupancy. And most recently, in 2019, it was theoretically shown that actually this phonon process that takes place only during the pulse should not degrade the purity of the state. You should get very high indistinguishability as well. So this is what we tested. We demonstrated uh, last year that actually we can actually get a very high occupation probability using this phonon assisted excitation. So it's not 100%, but it's 85%. And knowing that we have gained a factor of two in terms of polarization selection is, uh, is quite nice. And we could test the brightness of the source. So we do get uh, a fact, more than a factor of two increase, uh, it's shown here. And the purity of the source is at the same level as uh, when you do resonant excitation. And what we could show uh, further is that you can basically get exactly the same performance that we used to have with resonant excitation, with phonon assisted excitation. But on the way, we went from devices which showed brightness between 10 and to 25% to more than 50%. So this is a nice um, uh, tool that we have introduced. And I like it because it's actually making use of the dirty environment that we are playing with uh, at our advantage. The second thing I wanted to share with you is uh, an application of our single photon sources that we implemented recently. Uh, which is actually in line with this idea that we need new states of light to scale up optical quantum computing and also some schemes for quantum communication. So the idea is that to scale up optical quantum computing or to implement these measurement-based quantum repeaters, we would like this kind of states of light where you have many photons that are entangled. To do that, uh, you can play with parity down conversion sources, which was done again by uh, many groups. And the state of the art is at the level of 12 photons. Uh, it's extremely resourceful. You need many sources, and then you play with gates, and, uh, and you end up with uh, some untangled photon, but in a post-selected way. There is a clear path to do that in a deterministic way, which has been proposed by uh, Linder and Rudolf in 2009, which actually used a single spin to untangle successively emitted photons. So the idea is that you have a spin in your emitter, and each generation uh, event creates a photon that is untangled with a spin, and you can do that repeatedly during the coherence time of the spin. That's demanding. There was the first proof of principle demonstrated in 2016, and we are working on it. I will come back to that later. In between, now, there is something that was proposed by Agai Eisenberg, which I find very elegant and nice, and actually perfectly suited to our sources. The idea is that we generate with our single photon sources, photons that are uh, identical in time and distributed in time. And the idea of Agai is that we can turn them into a gate, a linear gate, and a memory, which is just a fiber loop. 
So that when the photon, the first photon has a 50% probability of going through or entering the loop, it will meet the second photon at the, at the gate and get entangled with the second photon. And you can do that repeatedly to generate long chains of entangled photons. So we did that uh, in a fully international collaboration. I mean, basically the group of Agai came to Paris. You can see it started when the church was still <laughs> okay. And uh, they built everything that fitted in the, this uh, suitcase and they came with this rack where everything, basically you have everything to untangle the photon and analyze the states. It's a very simple setup that we plug to our single photon source. We generate photons, we send them in the, in the loop here and you have basically polarization control, beam speeders and polarization analysis. And with that, we uh, could demonstrate the scheme so for people doing a uh, liking logics uh, picture of this, uh, this is how you can understand the, the, the scheme. You have different components that implement uh, Adama, uh, control Z gate, phase gates, etc. And we did that up to four photons. So we did that up to four photons and we could show um, with different sources, we could generate two, three and four photon linear cluster states um, with an entanglement witness, which was uh, um, reached uh, each time of a bit limit at the four photon level. And we are working now to increase the photon number, uh, improving on everything. So I would say this was done about the time of the moving. So we had to rush uh, to do these measurements. Um, in the last part of my talk, and I don't know how long I've talked already. Yeah, it should be fine. Uh, you're fine, just keep going. So I want in the last part of my talk to discuss uh, something which is a bit on the side, less oriented toward quantum technologies, uh, which started a bit like revisiting a spontaneous emission in our system and ended up with creating new states of light encoded in the photon number basis. So um, I want to, uh, we wanted, we, we didn't want it actually. We, we, we found ourselves in the position to understand what happens when you do um, coherent control with a two-level system, which sounds like the most basic thing, right? You have a laser which creates a quantum superposition of ground and excited state. And somehow uh, it was unclear whether you generate these states, that is co the coherence that is inputted at the atomic level could be trans transferred to the electromagnetic field. Whether you create a superposition of vacuum and one photon when you do that. And actually, uh, we uh, studied that uh, basically because we were already doing a measurement. Yeah, uh, I moment, it was not good. Uh, you, we were already doing measurements at a low to test that, and we were observing weird things, and uh, we understood uh, that we were indeed creating quantum superposition in the photon number basis. So the idea is that when we uh, when we take two of these states here. Uh, photon number superposition, and we send them on the beam splitter, we do a Hongo middle interference uh, with uh, a freely evolving phase on one path here. And what if I revisit the Hongo model interference in this uh, framework, what we are doing is that instead of sending a Fox state one at each input, I send quantum superposition of zero and one at the input. And I have now an additional phase that comes from the Max Angel setup that I have. If I look at the output state that we get after that, we have the expected 2, 0, minus 0, 2 that we always teach uh, to our students when we explain the angle Mandel effect. But we have now no new terms. There is vacuum, of course. And there is also single photon terms that appear here and that leads to a signal on the detectors that is depending on the phase. And so with this very simple uh, model here, you see that actually Sorry, when you do uh, Hongo Mandel interference, normally you look at the coincidences here because they tell you if there is a two photon part here. But when you look at just a single count here now, you see that you should have, if you have a quantum superposition, we should observe variation of the signal on each detectors in opposite phase and with a dependence that depends on the fraction of vacuum of the state. So it's, it can be seen as a self homodyne uh, kind of in experiment. So if now we complexify a little bit the picture to extract what is the purity in the photon number basis, the purity in the frequency basis of our photons, we can show that the, the this single count at the output of the detectors should vary with the phase, 
with a visibility that depends both in the purity uh, uh, that depends both on the purity in the photon number basis, the purity in the frequency domain, and the vacuum population of our state. So if we observe oscillation, it means that we have both purity in the frequency domain and in the photon number basis. So basically, this is what we were observing. So I show you a typical signal here. So we were exciting around pi over two here. So the laser is around here. And we observe that the single counts on the detectors oscillate. Uh, so they oscillate freely in time because we don't stabilize the phase and we have a lot of counts. So we don't need to stabilize the phase uh, in time. We can uh, really access uh, to the phase with these measurements. And from this, you can define the visibility of the oscillation. And we can do that for different, um, for different excitation powers, which actually control the vacuum population of the state. And we could actually observe that you get the highest uh, visibility for the smallest excitation where the vacuum population is the largest. And it decreases as expected theoretically when you go to higher population of the state. So we do create with this uh, scheme superposition of zero and one photon, and we can control the populations and the phase between the various components with our laser. So that was the first demonstration that uh, we, we provided two years ago. And I want to present you the last uh, uh, extension of this work that was actually proposed by uh, Carlos Santon and Stephen Wine, uh, postdoc and PhD student working on this project, where they have uh, continued to play with this idea that uh, you can uh, have quantum superposition in the photon number basis. And they, we show now uh, photon number entanglement generation just using spontaneous emission. So the idea is that uh, we are playing just with a two-level system, uh, and textbook physics tells us that when we excite a two-level system, bring it to its excited state. Uh, if I describe spontaneous emission in a very basic way, my system in this is in an entangled atom photon state over the spontaneous emission. The system is in its excited state, and the probability of being in its excited state decays like the spontaneous emission decay time T1. And when the photon has been emitted, the system is in the ground state with one photon, and you have the complementary factor. So this is uh, the simple picture that during spontaneous emission, there is entanglement between the atom and the photon. And if I stop at a delay which is equal to uh, log two uh, of the spontaneous emission, I have the equal probability of having emitting a photon or not having emitting a photon. So the system is in a state where there is excited state with zero photon with half probability and ground state with one photon with half probability. So there is no photon emitted or one photon emitted. If at this moment we just implement a second pipers, we basically implement some kind of atom photon gauge where if the atom was excited and had not emitted a photon, we bring it back to the ground state. And if the photon uh, the atom had emitted a photon and uh, had not been excited, we bring it again to the excited state. So at the end of this second pulse, we end up in a process where there is the first part of the state gives no photon at all. And the second part of the state gives two photons, one emitted in the early time bin and the other in the late time bin. So then you can think of the emission process as a, as a time bin encoding and you create Basically, at the end of the process, you create this uh, bell state encoded in the time bin, where you have this 0, 0 plus 1, 1 early late time bin state that, gener that is generated at the end of spontaneous emission process. So we've done that. We have played with just two pulses on the two level system. Uh, of course, all this works only if you have a good coherence during the spontaneous emission. There is no pure dephasing, not too much pure dephasing on the atom, etc. And you end up with an entangled state in the photon number basis encoded in time bits. So we can see that by doing, we can see that we create this state actually by doing some correlation measurements. So we excite twice and we do a second order intensity correlation as a function of time. And what you see on this map is that you should not have a signal unless you have two photons emitted. So you have only signal because you have a two photon fraction of uh, emitted. And it only happens after we have excited the second time. So uh, actually, with this two times correlation function, you can actually uh, reconstruct the time bins of emission here so that we can actually visualize the early and late photon that are emitted. Then we can um, play with a delay between the first and second pulse. So if we excite a second time too early, 
the atom has a very little probability of having a material photon. So uh, we bring it back to the ground state before it had to change to M. So on average, the number of photons is very low. And if we excite late, then we can actually have two photons completely uh, delayed in time. So at the magic uh, time uh, that I presented before, you have exactly one photon on average, which is emitted uh, in this untangled state. And if you go to G3 correlation measurements, you can see that actually we have actually almost zero probability of having one or three photons and only a, a crossover between zero and two photons. So we create really the state of zero plus two, but it's two in two time beams. And to access the coherence of the state in the photon number basis, we just go back to exactly the same key scheme I, as the one I presented before to evidence superposition of zero and one. We do again the hongu mandel interference, and there is again, so now the equation gets very, very difficult, but you end up with some uh, coherence that uh, manifests themselves by uh, fluctuations, uh, dependence, sorry, on the coincidences on the phase here. And from that, we can extract the two, the two photon coherence and the single photon coherence and measure the fidelity to this Bell state here. So we found, so it's not uh, spectacular, right? It's just uh, 80, 85%, uh, not even 85%, 82% uh, uh, fidelity to the Bell state, but it's, uh, it's an interesting way to generate uh, entanglement uh, using the spontaneous emission as a tool itself. And actually the limitation in our implementation is that our photons are way too fast. Our photons are too fast for detectors that exist uh, now. So if someone would were to implement this scheme with uh, nanosecond, tens of nanosecond time scale uh, emitters, they would get very high uh, fidelity to base state. And then you can imagine to pile up as many pulses as you want and start to play with gates at different times to create more sophisticated states of Okay, so I'm finished. I just want to mention <clears throat> some ongoing works that, I'm, that are coming, so some of them, not, of course not all of them. One that comes from this uh, superposition of zero and one photon. Uh, when we got this uh, new way of generating zero plus one, I turned to some theoretician of boson sampling to ask them whether this would allow to gain in complexity. So, the answer is that we don't lose, and maybe we could gain. So we are starting to implement this kind of boson sampling experiment with uh, the group of Jelmer and Emma in the Netherlands. The other um, uh, consequence of this study is that uh, we work with Alexia Oufev, who is working on the uh, quantum uh, thermodynamics and exploring the energy exchange at the quantum level. And they came up uh, last year with this nice proposal, uh, uh, strongly inspired by our work, on how to evidence that you can actually extract work from coherence. And this is some uh, measurements that we are finishing right now. And it's in line with, uh, with that. It's just uh, basically the idea that when you have quantum coherence, you can add or subtract work to a battery and you can uh, really show that you actually can uh, convert heat into work. And the last thing I wanted to mention is, of course, this, uh, this idea that I think many uh, of us are pursuing, uh, which is, I think, the next challenge for us is to generate directly this cluster state with spin photon entanglement. So the idea is very basic. I go back to the scheme I was mentioning before, where you have <clears throat> this optical selection rule with a spin state here. And basically, if you have circular polarization here in selection rules, you excite with linear polarization, and you end up with a spin photon entangled state. And if you do that repeatedly, when your spin is processing, you can create GSZ state. And if you do in between, if you add in between some gates on the spin, um, you can create cluster states or more complex, complex states of light. And uh, with that, we are actually collaborating with, uh, uh, with John Finney and can we are in some European consortium. So one of the difficulty in doing that in an efficient way is to be able to do resonant excitation and still collect all the polarizations. It's, it seems uh, trivial, but it's actually a very big problem. And it goes back to what I was mentioning in terms of uh, reducing the efficiency of the source. So you see that in this scheme, I was sending the laser on the side to try to find a way to get rid of the laser and still excite in all polarization degrees of freedom I want. Actually, what we are very happy is that with is that our photon assisted excitation scheme allows us to do that now. We don't have any problem anymore about polarization selection. 
And what I'm showing you here is actually that we are implementing the funnel assisted excitation scheme in a, in a quantum dot where we have a hole. And we, what I'm showing you here is actually the ob direct observation of the whole precession, sorry, the whole spin precession with the magnetic field. So we basically create a state and uh, we excite, uh, we collect in a circular polarization, we excite in circular polarization. So we know the state is in spin off and then spin up and then we see it evolve when you apply an in-plane magnetic field. And uh, this is uh, also direct observation, which shows that actually we have some room some to, to work with this kind of spin to do a cluster state generation. With this, I want to thank the wonderful team I have the chance to work with. So this is uh, uh, the group uh, right now. Uh, Long-term collaboration on the growth and technology side with Aristide Lement and Isabel Sai. Long-term collaboration on the solid state physics with Louis Clanco and Olivier Krebs. Uh, all the others um, are uh, non-permanent researchers, postdoc and uh, PhD student. We are extremely talented. So I've shown you work from Hélène Olivier, Sarah Thomas, Tiwan Ho, uh, Marie Billard, Clément Millet, Ilse Mayette de Buvinger, Elam Medi, Nathan Cost, Mathias Pont, Stephen Vine. And we have uh, this third line here is a, uh, another research line that is led by Daniel Kimura. Uh, some of you know him very well. Is working um, on nanoacoustic, and uh, we have joint program to work together to control the acoustic environment of a quantum. Last but not least, a lot of useful, uh, highly fruitful collaboration with Alexia Ofev on the theory side, and uh, lately with Christophe Simon of Calgary. And I want to mention these two guys here, uh, Valérie Angès and Nicolas Sumaski, who were. Uh, the one to obtain beautiful single photon sources back in 2016 and who created Cordela. And since Emmanuel, you mentioned it, I added a slide to present where Cordela is right now. So this was the team in this November. Uh, they, are, they were first hosted in our lab. So this is another beautiful picture of our building. <laughs> uh, but uh, they have just a tiny office and a tiny lab in uh, this building and they took new uh, offices and labs uh, 10 kilometers away. Uh, and the team here is already completely uh, out. I mean, this picture is already, already out of date. Now there are more, there are around 20 uh, engineers in Candela. And they are developing this standalone uh, single photon source where everything is included. So you have the, the cryogenically cooled single photon source. But they have worked on the integration of the source in the pigtail uh, geometry. And you have the lasers, the electronics, and even if you want to play with multiple photons, they have developed the demultiplexer, et cetera. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Pascal, uh, for this wonderful tour de force to the exciting physics um, with these uh, single photon sources and the entanglement you can create with that. I'm sure there are several questions and comments. So, Please either just unmute yourself and start. I will try to mediate a bit or just raise your hand in the chat or post in the chat. So I see Gerhard is unblinding himself. So I guess you want to ask a question, Gerhard. Yeah, for, well, before I ask a question, thank you very much, Pascal. Yeah. One, wonderful experiments, uh, really beautiful. Um, I'm, I have a question concerning the experiment that you did with your Israeli colleagues, uh, yes. Eisenberg and, and others. Um, maybe because it was a little bit fast. Um, yeah, you, yeah. you said you generate cluster states. Yes. Can, can, you, can you control which cluster states you, you generate? Um, yeah. Because in principle, there are infinitely many cluster states. No? Yes, yes, yes. So I'm sorry, I removed the slide that was showing explicitly the state that we are generating. But basically what, uh, what so in the first implementation here, the, it's just linear cluster state for now. And uh, the state we generate depends on the, the gate we, uh, the, um, what we do before the gate, the entangling gate here. So um, we are working toward the next implementation where this will not be an active element anymore. And this will, be, this will not be a passive element anymore. We will go to an active element that between photons which switch in terms of operation to go beyond uh, the simple cluster state that I, I, I presented before. And actually we could even go to 2D cluster states. Um, yeah. So which, which cluster state did you produce, may I ask? I need to, I, so I, uh, I should go back. I will fetch the slides 
for later. Um, is it a cluster state or is it the G86? No, 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 it's a cluster state. So the four photon, so actually the um, for two and four photon, these are linear cluster states, and uh, to a single rotation, they are you know you can represent them in a various way with just one transformation, right? So I have I removed the slide because I thought it was too technical to show you the state, but I can show you later if you want. Okay. But it, it's a linear. It's a linear cluster, state, just a linear cluster. State. So one one dimensional cluster. One dimensional cluster state yeah. encoded in polarization. They should distribute in different angles. Very nice. Can I ask, so in the, uh, the line width, Pascal, you showed for the uh, line widths of the quantum dot emitters. Uh, actually, one thing I was a bit curious, you showed that the line width, the line width looks as it was broader for low temperatures than for higher temperatures. The nine in the Kelvin. beginning, yeah. yeah. Yeah, in the beginning, the 9 Kelvin and 20 Kelvin. Uh, or is it just should we too much into this? I mean, your main point was between the dashed line and the salt. Yeah, the next one, next slide. Yeah, this one, this one. But it looks on so the nine Kelvin data. Yes. It's actually no, it's not. It's not an error. Um, okay. It's not an error. It's the um, it's the effective person effect you get. Okay. Is the fact that uh, the line width of the single zero for non line. Um, is uh, determined by, I mean, the personal effect is something that normally we describe when you have a monochromatic emitter in the broad cavity, right? Mm. So we get away from this because we start to have uh, a strong acceleration of spontaneous emission. We are in the regime where we are deep in the acceleration of spontaneous emission. And when you warm up, uh, basically you, you, you change the balance between the, the personal effect of the fun on sideband and the, on, the Purcell effect on the zero phonon line, and you end up with a less efficient Purcell effect for the, phonon, for the zero phonon line. So the line width of this is the Purcell enhanced line width, okay? And it's not an error. It's really what happens when you warm up, you end up having an effective Purcell effect on the zero phonon line that decreases to, uh, to, uh, progressively. All right. Okay. I didn't notice that, thank you. <laughs> I was just wondering, it's strange. Usually, these things get narrower when you cool, right? So you. Yes, are... yes, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't pay attention. Yes, it's true, but, but uh, it, it's, it's exactly that, and we we have uh, observed that uh, clearly. That uh, I mean, for a long time, the community was using temperature to tune the quantum dot with the cavity, and we were never getting the personal effect that we expected. It's because of the phonon sideband. Actually, you have a, a very complex way that things evolve with temperature. I have another just just stupid question on the pictures where you can you show a picture again of the emitters where you have the um, really on the chip um, on next slide maybe or something. No. No, no. What are you looking for? Just a picture of from when you see the emitters on the chip. So your cavities with the emitters on the chip. And one uh, so the, yes, well it was the other I one. know, I know, I know, I know. That no? Yes, yes, yes. For example, this one. How do you choose the, the placement seems kind of random of these yeah. emitters? Why is it so so first question, why is it why is it placed like it is placed? And and, and then the second, so this is just where you find the dots in the material and you just yeah. it more and then you just place the cavities there basically. Yes, exactly. And we yes, exactly. Okay. okay. And I didn't describe that because for me it's old news and we yeah, we've been doing that for years now. But right. the technology so is that. There, right. there is still not, uh, to my knowledge, there are still not good quantum dots with side control position. Mm -hmm. The best quantum dots are still the, the natural ones, the best ones. So we, we don't care that we are not equally spaced. I see. So if you would want to make now arrays out of this, it's a bit tricky, no? So if you would want to really push this for the single photon emitters to... So it depends on what you it depends yeah so it depends on what you think of it's very easy for us to uh, if you think of fabrication to fabricate uh, wafers where we have a single photon source per a hundred square meter for instance and this would be pigtail fiber pigtail mm. that's not a problem so with that we can already fabricate many of them mm. then of course if you think of doing everything on cheap uh, I think the position is not the only problem you have. Mm -hmm. Because controlling the wavelength of a quantum emitter uh, enough, uh, I mean, at the quantum level, 
the quantum requirement is so demanding that you don't really care that they are at the right position. They won't be at the right spectral position. So in the long term, I think... Um, but the spectral come out, some of this can be tuned, no? So you have some tuning points. Exactly. So, exactly. so you're right, in the long term, uh, the ideal uh, situation uh, would be to have on a chip emitters on the square, on the, yeah, and for each of them, all the tools you need to tune them. So that's possible. That's for sure possible. Mm -hmm. And I, groups are working in this direction. I am aware of recent works coming from Germany, which probably should make that possible I see. soon. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I think for intermediate scale things, it's completely okay like that. And, uh, and meanwhile, the, if we show that there are applications, then there is more pool to further develop what you're mentioning, which is actually very, very hard. Yeah. Good. Are there more questions, comments? The can, audience? I, can I ask another question, Emmanuel? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Go ahead. Sure. Um, uh, Pascal, you, you put a lot of effort into improving the efficiency of your source, and, yeah. and, and this is beautiful. Um, so, so in, some sense, in some sense, I have the following question. I mean, if you have zero efficiency, you, can't do, you, you can do zero experiments. <laughs> yeah. If you have 100% efficiency, you can do infinitely many experiments. Yes. Um, but it takes infinite amount of time and resources to build a, a, a single photon source, which has 100% efficiency um, somehow. Um, and, and, and now if you have this source, uh, there are losses all over the place. Uh, so you know, there's out coupling out of the cryostar, there's in coupling into optical fiber, there are propagation losses and so on and so on. So, so at some point I could imagine that uh, improving the efficiency of the source doesn't matter anymore because you have so many losses um, in, in the rest of your propagation line. So, so, so what do you think is it maybe a kind of optimum um, is, or, um, is there, or is there an optimum between uh, I think there is a, between so. resources basically that, that you need to put into the in, into your work and 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 what in the end you have no? yeah 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 so um, so there is a threshold I think for scalability for optical quantum computing which is uh, derived at two thirds overall efficiency of source combined with detection. So there are theory papers, which I, to be honest, not in detail understand, that show that photon optical quantum computing is quite uh, tolerant in this regard. And if you can go above a threshold of two thirds uh, for the source times the detector efficiency, you can scale up quite a bit. Assuming that there are no, no losses in between. No even if there are losses in between. So this is where it gets tricky <laughs> and I'm not able to explain it fully. But uh, so in this uh, sense, uh, I think we are getting very close to that. I think the community uh, will soon reach this two thirds threshold. And then on the rest, the rest is very important, but it's a classical engineering problem. Uh, so. I can say from my very tiny experience in that, that just going from the my lab approach to Quandela's approach, we have gained a factor of three inefficiency on how we do things to not to, to, to gain, to not lose photons on the way uh, between the, the source itself and the fiber. And um, I didn't mention that. So I, I, I showed the picture where we, we just fiber pigtail the source by putting the fiber just on top of the micro pillar. And in this condition, we find that we can have very high coupling efficiencies above 90% with no optics in between. So, so this engineering problem, I think to some extent to answer your question, I think it's the summary of my career, right? I started by making random device and I made them not random. And I thought, okay, now it's not random what I will do with that. And actually it opened many doors for many more studies. And each step you break some engineering problem, technology problem, you end up doing a lot of more interesting and sophisticated physics. So I think it's a really, uh, it's a joint effort. And I think whenever we compromise on the 
efficiency and control of our device, somehow we, 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 we limit, as you said, we limit what we can do afterwards. And you know that better than me because you, you are the, you've done some so, so amazing thing with your atoms. So. Let's go. I have another, let's see if there's anybody else who wants to ask a question. Otherwise, I have another question <laughs> that I'm curious uh, to pick your brain on. So I'm wondering, so in this, if you look at this photonic quantum computing, you introduced the psi quantum, Xanadu approach, you show, showed your work on the generation of cluster states. Can you comp can you maybe say what's the advantages or disadvantage of these different approaches? I mean, I'm not so into the field of photonic quantum computing, so I think having you so, here, what, think, so why would you choose one approach over the other, and why is the what's the advantage or disadvantage? Yeah, so psi quantum is really going to the universal large scale quantum computing using heavy um, integration. But um, the idea there is, as you said, they just have an array, whole array of single photon sources or squeezed. Uh, yeah, know. so if I want to compare what I would do with what they do, yeah. <laughs> that's a very, very clear answer. They are to make a source with uh, uh, the same efficiency as ours, with the same performances, they would need to multiplex a hundred or a thousand sources of theirs. So the engineering problem behind this is just, for me, is spectacular. I see, I see. But in principle, yeah. what they would want ideally is this array of your sources, no? For their yeah. Sources. So actually, ideally, exactly. I think the first, yeah. okay. the first stage of of their calculation starts with more than two thirds efficient single photon sources. Yes. Uh, and uh, the way of doing that is they are betting on heavy integration with semiconductor chips. And the way we are doing that is even though our devices are randomly spatially distributed, we can fiber picture each of them and couple them and send them off chip to the next chip, right? So that would be the comparison between our approach to psi quantum approach. Xanadu is a very different scheme because they are playing with continuous variable. It's more, uh, it's newer mm -hmm. uh, from what, they started a lot with the idea of sampling problems. And what I understand is that uh, it's not, a scheme that could be universal. It's not, they don't have a path to universality yet, I would mm. say. Uh, then if you think of, um, I mean, but it is in the comparison is between discrete variable and continuous variable. I think uh, uh, there are a lot of possibilities with continuous variable, but it's, it's at an earlier stage of development. So the gate, the single qubit gates are quite demanding and things like that. So the challenges are completely different and actually quite orthogonal to the discrete variable, which has been explored for a much longer time. Very good, thank you. I, I have one more question maybe concerning the slides that you show here, uh, coupling two quantum dots. Yes. <laughs> or maybe three or four or five or six or 10 or whatever. Yes, actually Nicola wants to do three soon. Yes, like, yeah. Can, can you <laughs> Well, this is work in progress, you're right. Can, yeah, so can, I, I want to- Can you say how, what the status is yes. or what? <laughs> yeah, the status is, the status is, I'm telling you all the secrets. The status is that we have right now 70% uh, indistinguishability for two sources. And we found out that the limitation is not yet the source itself, but our lab. <laughs> Sorry to say yeah. that, but when you, do solid state physics, we don't have the same habits that people doing atomic physics have of having extremely controlled electric uh, um, voltage source. Uh, or, I mean, you stabilize everything in your measurements and we never stabilize anything. And we found out that the 70% I've just told you are limited by classical noise, slow noise in our measurement room. So we are just, a grading our lab right now for but, the but, next run of measurements. I mean, I would say 70% is already fantastically good. Yeah, it's good. I'm happy with it, but it's not yeah. good enough. <laughs> it's not good enough and it's super frustrating that we know that it's just because everything fluctuates and it's not the source limitation yet. It's the very classical environment of the source, the vibration of the cryostat, the, 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 the voltage source that we are using and these kind of things. I, I, I would have thought if there are some frequency difference, some difference in the phase evolution, some difference in the 
in the envelope of the photon which is emitted uh, and, and all these all these kind of things between the two quantum dots that degrade yeah, so the visibility. No? So 70% is, is, is wow, good. And it's at the highest efficiency. It's not at low power. It's at the brightest when they are operated at their maximum brightness. So we are happy with that, but it's, we are not happy with that, actually, both. <laughs> we think we can do better because the temporal decays are very similar. If we were just looking at the temporal decays, we would have much higher. We would be above 90%. Yeah, emission, emission time, jitter, temporal uh, envelope, phase evolution, all kinds of things, no? I mean. Yeah, but right now what's limiting most of it is uh, actually intensity and stabilities that are coming from the setup itself. So this is one of these situations where you say, oh, I know the problem, you unmount everything and it takes weeks to be back on track. <laughs> so this is where we are. Very good. Are there more questions or comments from the audience? Looking. Well, if not, Pascal, uh, thanks so much again for this really fantastic talk. Very exciting results. Thank you. And for I understand you have more meetings on different levels going on still, so we're still making use of you. Uh, thanks for sharing your time with us. And uh, yeah, as 